Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the University of Southern Queensland. I'm Professor Peter Schubel, and I'm the Institute Director for the Advanced Engineering and Space Sciences. We run a program here uh, called Research Giants, where we invite eminent visiting professors from around the world to come and share their knowledge with us uh, in the hope that uh, we can collaborate further with our own expert researchers here at the University of Southern Queensland. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing um, a, very, a very distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. John Russell. Uh, John Russell is the Chief Engineer of Manufacturing and Industrial Technologies Division at the US Air Force Research Laboratories, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. He leads the division's engagement with the Air Force Life Cycle Management Center to identify critical manufacturing needs. He has strategic oversight of the division's investment in manufacturing needs for future high-speed weapons. He also leads the strategy development to maximize the Air Force's value from manufacturing US institutes. Dr. Russell is a leading expert in composite materials through the Composites Affordability Initiative, the Department of Defense's largest program on composites. He led a joint service and industry team of over 400 people to develop, design and manufacture methods that enable the use of large integrated and bonded structures for military aircraft. As a manufacturing lead for X-55A Advanced Composite Cargo Aircraft, he transitioned lessons learned from CAI into flying demonstrations of large integrated and bonded structures. These efforts have fundamentally changed how military aircraft are being built today. John has uh, many levels of awards and, and recognition, including the SME Fellow, the SAMPI Fellow, Secretary, Secretary of Defence Award for Excellence and the AFRL Commander's Cup. And more recently, last year in 2019, he was awarded the AFL, uh, AFRL Fellow, an honour which represents the top 0.3% of AFRL's professional staff. So it's my pleasure now to, to introduce John Russell to the stage, who will he'll give us an overview presentation today. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here at USQ. It's great to be in Australia, in particular because back home right now, we're supposed to get four centimeters of snow. So I'd rather be here in the summer. So with that, let's get started here and talk about uh, why I'm here today to talk to you about what the Air Force Research Laboratory is doing with our future composites manufacturing plan. So before I get into that, let me tell you a little bit about my organization. Uh, one part of AFRL focuses specifically on manufacturing technology. Uh, how do we reduce the cost of all the airplanes and the missiles and the ground equipment that the Air Force uses? Uh, you, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of these things are very pricey. So anything we can do to reduce those costs to have money go back to the taxpayers is a good thing. So we look at it in terms of new construction from new airplanes that are being built like the F-35, but we also look at, on how we better sustain our fleets. Uh, you may have heard that the B-52 is probably gonna be in service for about 100 years. So because of that, uh, every time it goes into the maintenance depot for its periodic maintenance, we're effectively rebuilding those airplanes each time. So how does the Air Force organically figure out how to reduce uh, the cost of the sustainment as well? But you know, through that, we're trying to look at how to redu reduce the time it takes to manufacture things, and how do we reduce the risk of manufacturing as new things come out of the Air Force Research Laboratory and, and make them manufacturable before they get put into service. So, and also just to give you a, an idea of the breadth of what we do, uh, our program has been around since the 1950s, and we've impacted a lot of things uh, in terms of manufacturing that have started for Air Force applications but have made their way out into broad-based manufacturing today. In particular, numerically controlled machining. Today, any machining house has a NC machining. Uh, that, the genesis of that was Air Force-funded work back in the 1950s. But uh, we did that, we did organic matrix composites. Uh, we brought uh, lean principles for manufacturing into the Department of Defense. Uh, and we invented the manufacturing readiness level as well, which is a, a key tool that the DOD now uses to assess not only how ready the technology is, but also how the manufacturing is. 
And, and currently we're looking a lot at uh, ceramic matrix composites, not only for turbine engines, but for high-speed missiles, uh, as well as some carbon-carbon. But you can also see that we've touched almost every Air Force system out there. Uh, the data I found goes back to the F-16. So we actually have uh, measurable uh, cost reductions for each of these airplanes uh, because of the work done through manufacturing technology. So let's talk about today. Uh, uh, as the Trump administration came on board, uh, they did a look in terms of where are we sitting in terms of uh, our national defense, what uh, does it look like our adversaries are doing, and how do we need to structure uh, not only how the Department of Defense operates, but what we're looking at in terms of technologies for the future. Uh, we spent the last 20, 30 years looking at uh, uh, more terrorism base and uh, adversaries that really aren't up to par with us on a technology basis. But today, the focus is more on uh, near peer adversaries, uh, uh, large countries that have big budgets uh, to, to do things to go against uh, the United States. So with that, um, we've changed our national defense strategy accordingly to, to address that. And technology uh, is specifically called out in the national defense strategy. You can see the, the uh, eight areas there uh, that uh, then Defense Secretary Mattis put in the strategy that we need to look at. Uh, and also with that, uh, uh, some of his people have broken that down into some high priority technology domains as well. So we had to structure what we do in manufacturing technology to address these key issues. And with that is our current investment strategy. Uh, if you take a look at the five uh, vertical columns there, these are our main investments. Advanced concepts really means uh, doing manufacturing work for the, the aircraft programs that are currently out there, things like the F-35, like the B-2, uh, B-52, et cetera. But we're also looking towards the future. Uh, there's a concept called a tritable aircraft out there uh, where we recognize that we can't do business like we have in the past. You know, I think every F-22 costs about 750 million US dollars. And uh, if one of those gets shot down, that is a big problem for the US because we can't rebuild those anymore. How do we change our mindset so that we don't have uh, all these exquisite systems anymore but have something that's uh, fairly cheap? So we're looking at uh, airplanes or UAVs that are on the order of about $3 million, not including the payload. So with this, you can change the game as to how you build it, how you design it, and how you use it in a fight. Uh, we're actually breaking a lot of rules here in terms of how the Air Force does airplane design and manufacture because this thing can be so cheap. And frankly, if it gets broken or gets shot down, it's not a big deal. It's, it's what we call a tritable, a new word we invented. Uh, we're looking at a lot of electronics as well with the network C3 systems. How do we, uh, how, how do our airplanes talk to each other as well as our satellites and, and back to the, the command centers, no matter what the environment is, especially if GP, GPS is denied. A lot of work going on in hypersonic strike. Uh, uh, the U.S. has been uh, concerned about uh, some recent hypersonic tests from our adversaries, so this has been a major thrust uh, of the DOD, especially in the last three years. I'd say the, uh, the funding has increased about 10x in terms of hypersonics. So we are trying to figure out how you actually make uh, a hypersonic uh, missile, uh, not only a, a one-off, but how do we make 10, 20, 30 a month? Then finally, we've got our eye on what's going on in, in the future, things like directed energy weapons, uh, synthetic biology to, to use for, for manufacturing instead of the more petroleum-based manufacturing, uh, and then quantum computing. Uh, we wouldn't look at uh, the algorithms per se, but what about all those uh, quantum devices? How do you make those at scale? So th those are things we have our eye on in the future. But cutting across all those, are things that are gonna be unique to every one of those systems. How do we look at the future factory and take advantage of automation, robotics, uh, the industrial internet of things, et cetera? Uh, and then the digital enterprise. Uh, how do we uh, look at those uh, digital twin concepts, the digital thread concepts, uh, and take advantage of all the data that's being given off during manufacturing to do something useful with it to reduce cost and cycle time? And finally, additive manufacturing, something we've been heavily invested in for almost 10 years now. Uh, how do we do unique designs? 
how do we uh, uh, do manufacturing out in the field or near the field uh, to replace parts quickly? And more importantly, how do we actually certify these things for use uh, on Air, Air Force systems? That is not a trivial matter. So with all that, let's step back now and talk about specifically composites and how it uh, looks in terms of all this. So uh, we had a great run on composites from 1995 to about uh, 2010, where we looked at the Composites Affordability Initiative at about 150 million US dollars total, and then the follow-on X-55A Advanced Composite Cargo Aircraft, where we looked at bonded structures, uh, we demonstrated them on an air vehicle scale and showed that you can actually glue airplanes together instead of uh, fasten them mechanically with screws or rivets. But since the end of that work, um, we've really struggled to figure out what's that next big thing out there? What's gonna be that, that uh, focus for our research? And it, uh, we really haven't had one. So uh, those of us in the composites community, AFRL, uh, started to think about what do we need to do in order to convince our, our leadership that we still need to fund this area. So why are we concerned? Um, well, first of all, um, apologize, this isn't, this isn't that big, but a lot of people say we can declare victory with composites because of their use on the F-35, Boeing 787, and some of the Air, Airbus airplanes. Uh, we figure out how to manufacture these things at scale. So some people say, well, why should we fund any more research? I always point out to them, though, that we're still funding metals research, even though as a society we've been working with metals for about 6,000 years now. Uh, uh, the other thing, because of that, they're almost a commodity material. This is a picture of Home Depot, uh, uh, where you go to get your building supplies back in the U.S. Uh, the composites are almost a commodity now. So, uh, again, it, it goes to our leadership's uh, argument that, well, maybe we're done. Um, uh, the DOD has also been a niche market uh, for composites. Uh, it used to be that the D US DOD would drive technological innovation in the United States, but that's really flipped now uh, where really commercial industry drives uh, a lot of the uh, next generation technology. You look at uh, corporate R&D, it's in the things like Google's and the Amazon's and the Oracle's, uh, not as much as the US DOD. Um, uh, in addition, we've abandoned uh, uh, materials development work in things like epoxies and bismalliamides, uh, the bread and butter of organic matrix composites. We've shifted our focus more towards carbon carbon and ceramic matrix composites in terms of uh, development of new materials. And we've left epoxies and BMIs and things in that temperature class uh, to uh, the commercial sector. Uh, and we have focused on things like polyamides. Uh, but again, that is a, of a niche market. That is a niche within a niche. Uh, we pretty much solved all those areas. So we're, again, struggling to figure out what's next. Then finally, uh, a lot of the money is frankly going to hypersonics and 3D printing. So with all that, uh, we, we were trenched to try to figure out where we need to go. So what are we doing now? We're doing a lot of work for things like uh, uh, a tritable aircraft. This is a picture of the, uh, the uh, XQ-50 eight, I believe it is, where it's an actual flying demonstrator for the uh, uh, low cost attributable aircraft concept. Uh, we're, we are gluing airplanes. I can't show you a picture of the airplane we're gluing together, but there are actually US Air Force airplanes being glued together now. Um, we're doing a lot of work to try to extend the service life of composites in current airplanes. Uh, typically the way the Air Force buys its planes is, okay, an F-22 is gonna last 20,000 hours and then we're gonna replace it. Well, that never happens. After the 20,000 hours, we try to extend it another 20. So the, the F-22 and the B-2 being the first in a generation of significant composite materials in airplanes, um, we are investing in how do we make sure that we know those planes can last another 20,000 hours with the composites on board. Uh, we are working with the people who are thinking about the F-22's replacement. Uh, it's called the Next Generation Air Dominance. It may or may not be an airplane. It may be a series of airplanes. It may be an airplane with uh, partners uh, of these low-cost attributable aircrafts. That's all in study right now, but we're working with uh, the program officers there to figure out what the, that's all going to be and what role do, do composites play in that. Uh, and then we're looking at uh, things like... Uh, tailored fiber preforming. 
So in terms of how can we make small composite parts, uh, parts less than 20 kilograms uh, in weight, cheaper than aluminum parts? Uh, this would be the holy grail for composites uh, uh, if we can get this done. And then finally, we're doing a lot of basic research, uh, looking at biocomposites for sensors, uh, looking at uh, nanoscale materials and how you incorporate those in the, in the more conventional uh, composite materials. So we're, we're doing some things and we're doing some good work, but there's not that, uh, that big goalpost out there that we need to go uh, shoot for. So with all that, we got together back in November 2018 and we had a workshop and we want to figure out what those four to six key technical focus areas are going to be in terms of composite research for the future and compose some high level roadmaps uh, to show what programs we need to fund so that at the end of the 10 years we achieve our, our goals. So the scope was to look at applied research or advanced technology development, so not basic research. And we wanted to make sure we focused on polymer matrix composites because there's significant work going on in the high, higher temperature materials uh, uh, such as carbon carbon and uh, ceramic matrix composites. Uh, these are all the partners we brought on board to, to come in and talk to us. So a lot of people from academia, uh, from uh, the big airplane manufacturers, uh, material suppliers, and, and people who actually build parts of the Air Force. So the challenges to, to our participants, uh, we wanted to have them think about how does the whole industry 4.0 concept uh, incorporate composites into it? Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, robotics, additive, et cetera, et cetera. And how do we, at the end of the day, look at, well, how can we do a step change increase in structural performance? Uh, so do we need to invent new materials? Do we need to invent new layups or, or whatever? Uh, how do we make parts at whatever the size cheaper than aluminum parts? Uh, and how do we work at advanced designs for airplanes that don't go through depot maintenance, so the low cost attributable concepts? Then finally, uh, multifunctional structures. We invested a lot of money in that over a number of years. Uh, are incorporating radars and antenna into aircraft structures worth the high cost uh, of building those things? So coming out of that, uh, some of the things we looked at, Next generation materials, yes, if we're going to have a step change in performance, we need to look at a next generation materials. We've been using pretty much the same materials in our airplanes since the F-22 program. So uh, IM-7, 977-3 uh, epoxy, IM-7, 5250-4 BMI. Um, there's a lot of gaps there in terms of unclear what the requirements are going to be for the next generation aircraft. But I think we took, put, drew a line in the sand and said we want a 25% improvement in notch properties, meaning uh, uh, compression after impact in particular, because that's what we designed for. Joining, um, some people are concerned that even though we are going airplanes together, that they might, may not be quite ready yet uh, for prime time. So we want to make sure that we're doing the, the, the final homework uh, to show that they truly indeed are ready and that in particular we can verify the bond quality uh, throughout the life cycle from, in the manufacturing floor as well as out in the depot 20 years from now. Certification. Uh, time and cost for, is for certification is, is quite, quite a bit. Uh, it costs anywhere from five to ten million dollars to qualify a new material and uh, it takes a long time. Frankly that's one of the reasons why the F-35 decided to use the same materials as the F-22. They didn't want to go through that pain. So how do we change the way we certify new material or qualify new materials and certify structures to reduce that by 75%? Manufacturing science. So there's a, a lot of tools out there right now uh, in terms of sensings, in terms of automation, uh, new modeling that we can take advantage of, but, but we really haven't done so as a community. So how can we have uh, a series of tools that are available for the entire industry that people can use in their trade spaces to, uh, for manufacturing. Uh, I've been hitting on this uh, quite a bit, but uh, we can't make this a tritable aircraft with the current manufacturing solutions out there. Uh, they're really good for F-35s and B-2s, not so good for an airplane that you want to cost $3 million at the end. So how do we, how do we take advantage of what's going on in the automotive community, uh, in the marine community, uh, et cetera, and bring that on board to aviation. 
And then quality assurance, uh, it's really more than post-process inspection. How do we take advantage of all that data generated during manufacturing and do something good with it? So, you know, here's a summary of our workshop. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff that came out of it. But uh, look into what I told you before all the results. Uh, um, so a lot of this is just more of the same in terms of what we're currently investing in. Uh, not necessarily something brand new, not that next big thing. So with that, I, I, I've taken it upon myself to start touring the world to see what's going on out there. I've been to Austria and Germany to see what's going on with BMW. Uh, I've been to a series of workshops with our, friend, or with our colleagues in Japan at the Ministry of Defense where they're looking at a future fighter uh, and, and what are the advancements and composites that need to happen there. Uh, three years ago, I came to Australia for the first time. I, I met Pete and, and saw what's going on here, especially in terms of uh, process monitoring and control. Uh, we looked at the Netherlands and uh, what's going on with thermoplastics. Uh, they really are the gold standard in terms of thermoplastics for uh, uh, aviation. Uh, Canada, working with the University of British Columbia, uh, doing a lot of great work in terms of modeling in particular and bringing in Industry 4.0 thoughts into composites. And finally, just this past fall, I was in England looking at a next, generation, next generation automation. So not just advanced fire replacement, but how do we uh, maybe take the person out of the loop altogether and just have robots lay up parts. So on top of that, I've been really looking at what the industry trends are out there these days. Um, there's going to be a lot of need for composites in the future. Uh, commercial aviation is talking about 40,000 new aircraft in the next 20 years. Right now in service, there are about 25,000 commercial aircraft. So this is huge. This is going to stress the entire supply chain uh, from Boeing and Airbus on down to the people who build the smallest part. Uh, so throughput is going to be a big issue, especially throughput so you don't have to uh, buy as much capital equipment. Uh, the, the LCAT concept, again, we may be building these uh, tritable airplanes on the order of thousands, tens of thousands, something the DOD hasn't done since World War II. Then finally, this urban air mobility concept. You know, people are talking about flying cars forever. I don't know if I ever believe that this is going to happen, but uh, there's a lot of people are starting to explore this space. Uh, uh, conventional companies like Boeing, but also companies like Uber as well. So uh, it's an interesting thought, and I think that the industry needs to be ready for all of this kind of stuff here. But so the bottom line through all this is all these activities are going to put stress on the supplier base. Uh, and we can't do it with the way we build things today, hand layup, uh, the current fiber replacement machines, and then our, our, our current methods of more analog construction rather than digital. So with that, our future focus, we're still going to look at those manufacturing science tools, but in particular, how do we integrate AI and machine learning, automation, big data, et cetera, uh, to have a suite of tools that we can reduce those cycle times? No. Uh, low cost agile manufacturing. How do we be aggressive on cure cycles so we can cut the autoclave time down in half? But also, how do we look at next generation automation? Um, currently, fiber replacement equipment is, is, more, is down more than it's up. Uh, we want to have a usage rates uh, being close to 100%. But we also want to have it laying down and not just stopped and waiting for somebody to inspect things as well. Quality assurance. So how do we have in-process sensors on a non-interfering basis uh, and have those as maybe an alternative to a proof test uh, uh, down the road so that we can actually don't have to worry about post-process inspection anymore. That's always been the holy grail uh, is to get rid of NDE altogether, just have it done in process. So with that, you know, this uh, community of composites has accomplished a lot in the last uh, 50 or 60 years. You know, the, this uh, community really took off uh, in the early 1960s with a report called Project Forecast out of the Air Force. And uh, because of that, uh, there's been a lot of great work done, as you can see, F-35, 787, et cetera. But we're not done yet as a community. Um, industrialization is going to be the focus for those next 50 or 60 years. And how do we get it away from being more hands-on to really more industrial like you see in, a, in an automotive factory? 
And I really think those Industry 4.0 tools are going to enable that next leap there. Uh, so it's not something that my generation has typically thought of, but I know folks in your generation are going to be on the job here. So I want to say thank you very much for having me here in Australia, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks. Excellent. John, thank you so much. Um, look, I just want to ask a question before I hand it over to the audience. And, uh, and you touched on, on the topic of material certification and, and inspection. Um, are there any lessons that we can probably learn from our metallic friends on, on how they approach these, or is, is it not transferable, or what's your opinion on, on that? That is a very good question. So, at least in terms of military aviation, we, we haven't had to use many new alloys either, like we haven't had to use many new composites. So, I think they're struggling with a lot of the same things. Uh, what's really given them some heartburn now is uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, making an additive manufactured metallic part is almost like making a composite material. And the folks in the Air Force are, who certify airplanes are struggling with how to certify additive manufacturing parts. So I think right. more they're going to learn from us right. in terms of our struggles uh, because all of the airplane certification rules are built around conventional metallic structure, sheet metal, aluminum, things like that. So I think we're going to be in it together in, in terms of figuring out what the next generation of uh, uh, material qualification and certification is going to be. It's, it's, glad to, it's good to hear that we're not the only ones suffering then, eh? Hey? Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to hand it over to the audience then. Is, uh, who wants to go first? Schweizer? Hi, John. Uh, uh, just wait. Uh, you touch on the um, low-cost agitable uh, platforms. Uh, you mentioned you're currently working on the... Um, glue uh, approach to for the low cost reduction and now you're looking at around the world in terms of automotive and the boat building industries uh, but at the same time uh, they are using the resin infusion or liquid composite molding uh, uh, in military com uh, composites you use autoclave, preprac system do you see any future in terms of um, liquid composite molding going to be entering military platforms manufacturing or not? I think there, uh, it's going to be a very powerful tool that we can use for things like the LCAT concept. The big question is how many of these airplanes are we going to build because the tooling costs are going to be pretty high. Um, if we're all going to build a thousand, I would say we might not look at them because I don't think people would want to spend the money on tooling unless we can figure out a cheaper way to do match die tooling. But if we go to maybe 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, then I think the economics are going to start to make a lot more sense for buying that tooling to use on something like uh, a low cost attributable aircraft. So, you know, we've got investments going on in low cost tooling right now. We've got investments in braiding and, and liquid molding and things like that. So we're exploring a lot of these spaces right now. Uh, in your opinion, the mainstream process for even for the low cost systems will be still be dominant by um, pre-prac autoclave process? Um, pre preg yes. I would say probably more out of autoclave okay. right, right now. So. Okay, thank you, John. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Alan? For the uh, presentation, <laughs> Alan Manalo from CFM. I noticed that uh, most of the focus of uh, your work is developing new materials, improving the manufacturing process. But I also spent some time in the US, in West Virginia. Uh, there is now an uh, increasing trend or interest in recycling composites, let's say, for, for uh, recycling wind turbine, and even, let's say, in civil composites, which is uh, very in its very early stage. But the discussion on recycling is now probably one important issue. I'm just wondering, is that also an issue, let's say, with, with this, uh, in this area of composites? So for us, recycling our airplanes at the end of life is not a military requirement. Um, it is going to be for commercial airplanes, especially companies that sell in the European markets. 
those European rules are really driving the entire world in terms of uh, commercial applications of composites or automotive, uh, wind turbines, uh, aviation, et cetera. So because we don't have a military requirement for that, we are going to rely on the commercial sector to get that work done. And I know there's a lot of smart people at Boeing working on that in terms of aviation type materials. Uh, and then the U.S. just set up a new manufacturing institute uh, specifically for automotive and wind turbines, and recycling is one of their key areas there. So for the U.S. as a whole, yes, there is research going on. For military, uh, no, not for recycling. Thanks for that. You mentioned about the ad additive manufacturing. Um, is that currently still mainly in the metal uh, material, not coming to the, the polymer-based? So there is a lot in terms of polymers, in particular for ducting for aircraft. Uh, and we're also looking at additive for, for tooling for aircraft. So how could you do rapid tooling through uh, printing up an Altem tool and then just uh, doing some uh, limited post-process machining there? Uh, we haven't done a lot in terms of incorporating carbon fibers in at this point. I personally struggle with what the benefit is the, between, uh, of that versus conventional composites uh, because of the performance hit you would take with uh, 3D printing with, uh, with uh, carbon reinforced uh, uh, nylons or whatever. Uh, but I'm open to the concept. I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. But yeah, the big bulk of it though is for metallic structures right now. Okay, um, just one last question in that case. I'm uh, Thiru Aravintan from CFM. Uh, my area is in civil composites, so I want to just uh, get your thoughts, particularly you have included industrialization is the key issue, particularly for low cost. In civil composites also we look for quality, but low cost. What are your thoughts on what are the things from other areas, apart from aerospace and other things where we can capture from your experience that should be looked into, like civil composites as well, particularly on industrialization? Thanks. So I'd say about 20 years ago, we actually uh, did some work with the construction communities. We, one of my colleagues actually uh, did a, a uh, education with industry tour where he actually left AFRL, was still our employee, but worked for a company that did construction research. How do you employ composites in construction? And it was very interesting in terms of... Uh, composite overwraps for columns for earthquake prone zones uh, using uh, composite based rebar uh, instead of uh, iron so that it doesn't rust um, and even looking at maybe some uh, fiber filling for for uh, concrete as well so there, there's a lot of stuff I know that there could be a crossover on um, and in talking to some of the people who work in civil construction uh, they are struggling with what the uh, return on investment is to have a bridge that's going to last 150 years versus 50 years through the use of composites. Is it going to be worth that much more money that the, that the composites are, are going to be worth? So that's probably the big thing is for construction, how you really get those costs down uh, to really dramatic levels. Uh, and I would say coming from military aviation, we're probably not the best people to talk to because we build – you know, $1.2 billion airplanes. So, um, but yeah, there, there, there's a lot to be learned by talking both ways. Excellent. Now, thank you very much, Dr. John Russell from the US Air Force Research Laboratories. Um, well, we appreciate your time coming here and, and we hope that uh, further collaboration between uh, the US Air Force Research Laboratories and, and USQ can happen in the future. Thank right. you very much for your time. Thank you. Cheers.